Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Online Church. If you've never met me before, my name is Helen, and it is my absolute pleasure to host you this morning. I am here near one of my favorite running tracks, and many of you know that I love running. But here are a couple of things you didn't know about me. Firstly, one of my New Year's resolutions this year is to get up at 4.30 and run down to the beach and watch the sunrise and I do my devotion down there. The next thing that you don't know about me is that this Wednesday, the 27th of January, it will be my 19th wedding anniversary with my amazing husband, James. We got married on the Australia Day public holiday, so that way he always remembers when it is. And uh, the other thing that you may or may not know about me is, is that I love kids. And I am so grateful for the goody kids and the leaders and everybody who helps out. And I am also super grateful and I love my own four beautiful children. But in saying that, who's excited about school going back this week? Shout out to the parents and the kids who are starting back at school. I know it's a crazy time, but I know also there might be some excitement in parents about their kids going back to school. Been a long holiday. <laughs> All right, so speaking of kids, a special mention to Boost and Youth who start back up this Friday. I run Boost with a, some amazing team leaders and we start from four o'clock at the stadium and we have games and sausage sizzle and it's so much fun. You are welcome to come along and we are always looking for more leaders if you would like to help out. Then Youth kicks off this Friday at 6.30 p.m. with a free-for-all night with food, open skate night, stadium games, and hangout. You can catch Jono via email at this address and check in with him about all the details. So we've been getting back into the rhythm of in-person gatherings, and I really want to encourage you to engage with us both online and in person. The 10 a.m. service is a great connection point. We have kids church running, little angels, and it's a great time to connect afterwards because we have a free brekkie. For the 5 p.m. service, we have communion, prayer and worship. It's a really reflective, beautiful time. I really enjoy it. That's the time that I engage. And it's a time where we can come together and worship and um, have a time of reflective moment together. So I encourage you to come along and register for either of those gatherings. This coming week is also a significant time for our country. Coming together in celebration, reflection and reconciliation for Australia Day. While there is great joy and gratitude for this wonderful country that we live in, we also recognise that it can be a tough time for others, especially for those in our Indigenous community. For those wanting to engage and learn more, Common Grace is hosting a special prayer service online January 25th that you can tune into, also via the radio. Auntie Jean Phillips, one of Australia's most senior Aboriginal Christian leaders. I'd like to uh, invite you to the Change the Heart services on the 25th of this month with Common Grace and the ACC TV. That would be a wonderful opportunity so that we can journey together. What a beautiful opportunity for us to lean in with love and prayer to those around us. Also, just a reminder and heads up that Good Life will be shut on Australia Day 26th of January, this Tuesday. A few months back, we heard a beautiful story about Lifehouse Resource Centre and the incredible work that they do. If you were inspired by their stories, now is the time to get involved. They are looking for some muscle and some able-bodied helpers to help collect items to deliver to their centre. If you would like to know more, please contact Ruth Jeffs and let her know that you are keen to join the team. 
Not sure if you've picked up on it yet, but we are currently working through our series of favourites. We're hearing from some of our community about their favourite scripture and what it means to them. And we're looking back on some of our favourite stories from last year. This is a personal one to James and I because Care Outreach came and visited us and cared for us when we were ministering way out west in Mitchell. So we're going to look back on that story and as we kick into a new year, it's still relevant to us today. Hello folks at Good Life, um, this is Bill and Melissa Close from Care Outreach. Um, just want to um, thank you for your long-term support of Care Outreach. Um, this is our 27th year of going out and visiting rural and outback families. Um, over currently about two and a half thousand families over 1.2 million square kilometres. And so um, we just want to thank you for your continued support. Hi, uh, Good Life family, I'm Ian, and I've been going to Good Life for quite a few years, many years. I uh, met my wife there, Jill, and uh, we really enjoy the fellowship that we have there. It's a great opportunity to be able to share with you my role here at Care Outreach. I've been here for just over 12 months and really enjoy the opportunity to run the warehouse and the shop and to help Care Outreach with what it does out west. Jill and I have been involved with Care Outreach since 2008 as um, volunteers, field volunteers. And so we would encourage anyone who um, would love to do that to come on board because it really is life changing, not just for the people you visit, but also for yourself as well. Care Outreach cannot do and achieve what we do without the support of incredible volunteers. And so if you, you might have seen the Care Outreach promotions over the years through, through church, and you might have been thinking, I'd like to do that one day, this might be your opportunity. Um, field volunteers go out, we go onto the properties, you have face-to-face -face visits, you spend time with these families, you get to know them and build a friendship. Um, yeah, 2020 COVID um, has affected us just as much as everybody. Um, we've had to rethink about how we do everything. A lot of our rural and outback families have been self-isolating, which is quite normal for them because all they do is just work on their farm. But it has meant they haven't been making trips into town and into the city to pick up supplies and things like that. Um, there's been a lot of um, nervousness about where COVID might go and so they have literally been staying on their properties which has meant that there's been a lot more people that loan, uh, a lot of loneliness, a lot of people that probably the depression has picked up quite a bit so the ongoing support has actually been really important and we've sort of had to reinvent ourselves as in we've been doing outback visits via Skype Zoom, FaceTime and all that sort of thing. Uh, just to spend time with people and make sure they're traveling all right. And, and every so often we just need to just um, jump in the car and go out and spend some time with them just to help them through. And, and maybe do a day on the farm and do some hard yakka with them and just spend some time um, letting them talk. So a few years ago with the amount of donations that were coming to Care Outreach, not all of them can be used out west because of the logistics of being able to get them out there. And also quite a few items aren't suitable. So what they started doing was in the corner of the warehouse, they started an op shop. And since then it's grown to take over the warehouse. Uh, and so now we have our care shop, uh, which people can come in. It's a lovely environment where they can have a look at uh, secondhand uh, items and buy stuff. The money that we raise from here helps with the vouchers that we give out to farmers. Um, out west, um, as well as helping with some of those administrative costs. So it's a really great way to get to know people and for people to be able to donate items that are of good quality that we can then sell on to people as well. 
So we cover uh, 1.2 million square kilometres and we break that up into 26 different regions and each of those regions are headed up by a pastoral couple and they head that area up and we have a team of volunteers that will come in and support them in visiting all the families that they have in their area. Also Jill and I had the opportunity to take on a role as base coordinator for the Charleville area. We'd been at Miles for the last 11 years and um, really have great connections with a lot of the families out there so it was a hard choice for us but we decided to take that step out because with Care Outreach it's the connections that make the difference and you get to know the families, you get to know their needs and how you can support them. Uh, the greatest need is um, we still have a lot of families recovering from drought. Remembering a lot of our families went through nine years of drought and a lot of them that really knocked a hole in the bottom line and are really struggling to actually get going again and so our major work right now is like the sort of dollars we're talking about it, it would be impossible to bail everybody out but our support is helping them through this period of time uh, to be able to deal with what they've got to deal with and also the Christian families to really support them and encourage them in their faith and it's a real faith walk for them to get through this period of time. So the main support is really encouraging them in that. One of the exciting for things for me in the role that I have here at Care Outreach is for me to see the stuff that we put aside next door, ready to go out west, to be able to load them into trailers, get them out there, and then to hear the stories of those coordinators when they come back of what they've been able to share with people and the blessings that they're being able to give. That for me has been a real blessing for me in this role that I have here at Care Outreach. Another area that can is a big help is through pre, prepaid visas. Uh, it's an area that we have done uh, a big, big push on the last few years. And it's, it's a win for the families, but it's also a win for the local businesses because we encourage them to support them and use them in their local communities. So we're, we're, you know, we're helping on multiple levels. So if you're able to help in that way, it would be awesome. Thank you so much Care Outreach for all that you do. I know that I'm personally grateful. Before we hear from Hannah Bartle about her favourite scripture today, we're going to head into a time of worship. Can I encourage you to just stop what you're doing, take a moment and to just enter this space with a time of reflection, of awe and surrender as we sing This Is Our God. is enough more than I need at your word I will believe I'll wait for you draw near again let your spirit make me new and I will fall at your feet
Today we have the great privilege of hearing from Hannah Bartle. She is an incredible educator and learner, worshipper and writer. And I can't wait to hear what she has to say. So let me pray as we enter into hearing the Spirit through Hannah. Heavenly Father, I just praise you and I thank you for your word. I thank you for the gift that it is to us. I thank you that it is life and light, it is challenging but also promising. Lord, I pray that as Hannah speaks today, that we would have open hearts, open minds, be surrendered to what you are saying to us and to go forth into our new week, being encouraged and challenged to grow deeper in our faith with you. Amen. Hi everyone, it's really great to be able to share with you again one of my favourite passages of scripture and today it's coming from Luke chapter 15. And the reason I'm sharing it is because it's a scripture that just speaks so beautifully about the nature of God and his heart for his people and for his kids. And I think even though this is a story you've probably heard many, many, many times, we still need the reminder about how much God loves us and then what we're called to do as a response to that love in loving others. And so we're gonna look at today the story of the lost son. So to really capture how grand God's love is for us and what this story really meant when Jesus was telling the people about this lost son, we need to understand the cultural and societal context that Jesus was teaching in and that Luke then writes about. Society, ancient society in Israel, in ancient Rome, was heavily based on this pendulum of an honour shame culture. Everything about you was summed up in how much honour you had. And particularly if you're a man, you avoided anything that could bring dishonour or shame upon you. Things like coming in too close a contact with slaves or the sick or women. Women in the public space had no honour. As soon as they stepped out of their house, they were shameful. And it was shameful for a woman to approach a man. And so men avoided women in the public space, which makes Jesus's actions all the more beautiful when we understand this, that he purposely engaged with those that might bring dishonor to him and in doing so restored their honor and took away their shame. And this story of the lost son is an example of this in a parable form. And so we have a father who would have been an elder in the community, very well respected, um, the patriarch of his family. And he has two sons. So these are all great things, bringing him a lot of honor in his community. But this young son comes to him and says to him in the equivalent modern version of, dad, I wish you were dead, you're not, but I really want you to be dead because I want your money. So can I have it and can I leave because I don't want to be a part of this family anymore? The father in this moment, and I love this, that we get this first glimpse of the heart of God here that Jesus reveals. The father had the right as the father, as the patriarch, as this honourable member of community to disown his son, to withdraw any inheritance that could be due him. He even had the right to kill him in the most extreme circumstance. He could have had him put to death. That was his right because the shame that this son had brought upon him in this act was going to bring him dishonor. And he as the patriarch would avoid it at all cost. But that's not what the father does. He willingly gives the son the inheritance and lets him go. And we know that the son goes and squanders it in very sinful, immoral ways. And Jesus uses hyperbole, this really drastic expression of him being with the pigs. He's gotten so debauched, he's so immoral that he's with the pigs, which were the most unclean animal in Jewish society that you could be associated with. And I love this turn of phrase that it says that the son came to his senses. 
and in an act of self-preservation, he decides, I'm going to go back to my dad because I could be a hired servant, a hired hand, and I will pay my way and work my way out of debt. It was a really common teaching with the rabbis at this time about paying and working your way to repentance and to forgiveness to make amends. It was about if you work hard, you might be able to, to be able to come to repentance, you might be forgiven if you work hard enough. And so the son has this thought, that's what I'll do. I'll pay my way. I'll work my way back to forgiveness. And so he goes back to his dad. And then in probably the most beautiful scene in scripture, for me at least, I think it's one of the most beautiful passages you read. We have the father who spots his son from way off in the distance. And scholars think, or they tend to believe that because this son was fairly young when he wanted his inheritance and he went off, the father knew that he was gonna squander it and he waited for his son to come back. He knew his son was going to return. And because of this, he sees his son and he runs after him. And again, we come back to this idea of honor shame in this society. A well-to-do honorable Jewish man did not run ever, unless it was in a life or death emergency. You did not run because to do so meant you had to hoik up your robes and expose your legs. And that was so shameful that no man would do it. But here again, the father runs which meant he was showing his legs and dishonoring himself, trying to get to his son. And his son would have had to come through the community, come through the village. The town would have known, here he comes. And we get a glimpse at maybe the state that the son was in when we're told that the father places sandals on his feet. He was coming barefoot and probably naked, semi-naked, maybe naked, totally shameful, coming into, back into the community. And the father comes and embraces him and kisses him. And in that kiss, before he's clothed, before shoes are on his feet, in that moment where he comes and hugs him and kisses him, he reconciles the son and brings him back into the family. His sonship is restored. And there's significance in the sandals being placed on the son's feet. The only people who got around without any shoes on their feet were the slaves. That's how you knew a slave was a slave. They were barefoot. This son comes back as a slave and the father placing the sandals on his feet restores him back to a son into the family. You're no longer a slave. You've become part of my family again. But in all of this, the father is choosing to take the son's shame upon himself and allow himself to be dishonored so that his son can become a part of the family again. And then we come to the feast. There's this beautiful feast and celebration because the son who was lost is now found. The son who was dead is now alive. And this meal wasn't just a fellowship meal, but it was a seal of mutual forgiveness. And it was involved in the whole, with the whole community. It wasn't just between father and son, it was between the community members, the people who knew what this son had done to this family and the shame that he'd brought. So this meal was a reconciliation, not just between father and son and God and man, which was what Jesus was trying to get at, but also between human and human. That the coming to the table and feasting was not just about reconciliation between God and man, but between human and human. And we know that that's such, um, such a clear point in Jesus's ministry. He was all about reconciling God and man, but human and human. Look at the communion table. Look at the Last Supper. It was about reconciliation and coming together. And this story ends with the older son, the father goes out to the older son because he doesn't want any part of the celebration. He doesn't want to come to reconciliation. And the father says, son, please come into the feast. And the son says, no. And again, in this honor shame culture, the father right then and there had the right to disown that son, to cast him out of the family, even to sentence him to death because it was disobedience to the father's will. 
But the father doesn't do that either. The father gives him the choice and he pleads to come and be reconciled. But the son is given the choice. Sin. 
guess my point in sharing this is for us to remember how much God loves us and that when we hear songs about Jesus taking on our shame, about being free from it and reading, this, reading it in the scriptures, it takes on a bit of a new meaning, doesn't it? That it was such a physical identity back when Jesus was telling this story. But God loves us so much that he would willingly take it all upon himself. So remember that we are his kids and he loves us. But with that, I guess, is my second point. And that's this, that this story isn't just about how much God loves us, but it's also a lesson for us and an example for us in how we're to love others. For those of us who've chosen to follow Christ, we know that we're called to be Christ-like and to do so means that we need to love others as he does. And how does he love? Well, he goes into spaces that we might think are maybe morally or ethically challenging to us. He goes into spaces that we might consider good Christians don't go, but he goes in to love. He loves those that are hard to love, that reject our love, that hate us for our love, but he calls us to do so. And I'm not saying this as someone who's got it nailed. In fact, I'm probably the person sitting up the back with a million questions and a really heavy heart, not knowing how to do that very well not knowing how to love because I'm hurt by my attempts. But I know that by the Spirit of God and the hope that Jesus gives us is that He will empower us to do so and to love like He loves us. But it means that we have to lean in and want to be that loving embrace to those who need it. We as the church need to be the loving embrace that celebrates and brings in those who think that they're too shameful or too guilty to be a part of this. That's our call. And so as we often pray, let your will here on earth be done like it is in heaven. May we, with the Spirit of God empowering us, love deeply. May we extend mercy to those who need it and forgive freely just as he has done so for us. That I love you with all of my heart and all of my soul. I will live for you alone. Thank you, Hannah, for that beautiful message and your incredible song. It is one of my favourites. You are such a gift to our community and we are grateful for you. And thank you, Good Life family, for tuning in again this Sunday. Don't forget that the centre is closed on Australia Day and that Boost and Youth are back this Friday, the 29th of January. I will see you, Boost kids, at 4pm and Jana will see you at 6.30. Have a great week.